welcome. As I first read the details of this story, I thought, okay, this isn't that mysterious. It seems like multiple failed attempts to prosecute a guy who many believe committed the crime. Still, I decided to dive further into this strange story, and as I learned more and more the twists, the turns, the deceit, and just flat-out craziness of what happened, I felt compelled to bring this story to you. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious, here at Odd Mysteries Stories. In 1982, the Salomon family vanished from their quiet neighborhood in Northridge, California, leaving behind a perplexing mystery that continues to baffle investigators to this day. For all appearances, the Salomons were a normal suburban family. Immigrants from Israel, 35-year-old Sol Salomon, his wife Elaine, their 9-year-old son Mitchell, and Elaine's 15-year-old daughter from a previous marriage, Michelle Hawkman, all lived in a quiet area of Northridge, California, where Sol worked as a fire extinguisher repairman and refiller. They were, by all accounts, a happy, perfectly ordinary, and a seemingly well-adjusted family. Elaine and Sol first met at a bar in Hollywood in 1971. She was a 28-year-old divorcee with a four-year-old daughter, Michelle. Sol was 24, an Israeli immigrant who had landed in Los Angeles a year earlier, driving a taxi and selling encyclopedias before setting up a business refilling fire extinguisher. After they married and had a son named Mitch, they moved out of their resident condo and into 19232 Lassen Street in Northridge. Michelle's biological father had given up his parental rights to her, but Sol never tried to adopt her, and she never took his last name. Burly and gruff, Sol stood more than six feet tall, wore a dark brown hairpiece, and despite carrying a good 50 extra pounds, often went shirtless, a lit cigarette dangling from his lips. Elaine had big, wide-set brown eyes and pale skin, with dyed pineapple blonde hair. She was a glamorous woman, and the couple seemed constantly surrounded by friends and family. The Salomons had a taste for the good life. Greek statuary surrounded their large swimming pool. There always seemed to be new toys, a large screen TV, VCRs, and clothes at their home, even a baby grand piano, although nobody in the home could play it. Then there was the parade of cars, the canary yellow Lincoln Continental Mark V, a midnight blue Mercedes Benz, the burgundy Rolls Royce. During occasional mother-daughter lunches, Elaine often took Michelle out in the Rolls Royce to dine on the top floor of the Bonaventure Hotel downtown. Rumors surfaced that Sol was an Israeli intelligence agent, a drug dealer, or maybe a gunrunner. Margaret Malarowitz, or as she was known to her friends as Marge, was Elaine's mother and Michelle's grandmother. Marge, later in life, would reveal much of her displeasure with her daughter's husband, whom she held responsible for her missing daughter and grandchildren. She has been quoted as saying, I hate Sol. I blame him, she shared her knowledge of their relationship many years after their disappearance. He, Sol, traveled to Europe without Elaine, slept with prostitutes, had stopped bathing regularly, and got involved in all sorts of unsavory activities. There were stacks of cash hidden behind picture frames, and who knows what else, she claimed. The truth, as Marge now shared it, was that Elaine was miserable. Marge revealed that her daughter had been having an affair and wanted desperately to leave Sol. Not long before she disappeared, Elaine confessed to her mother, only to have Marge mark off all the reasons leaving was a bad idea, not least of which was that Elaine's boyfriend, who she said didn't have two nickels to rub together. So I told her to stay. You have a beautiful home. You don't have to work. You go out with your friends and have whatever you want. Stay with soul, she was quoted as saying, now consumed with guilt. So there you have some idea of who the Salomon family was that disappeared mysteriously in 1982 from Northridge. Let's explore the disappearance of this family. On October 12, 1982, Elaine's parents were visiting the Salomon home. At 6 p.m., Sol told everyone he was going to a car auction with a business associate named Harvey Rader and left. Elaine's parents went home at around 10.30 p.m., and one hour later, Elaine was in the middle of a phone conversation with her friend Barbara Levy when the doorbell rang. Elaine told her friend Harvey's at the door before ending the call, but this turned out to be the last time anyone ever heard from the family. 
It wasn't until October 13th in the evening a day later that neighbors were alerted to the fact that the Salomon's pool had been overflowing and flooding another neighbor's yard that someone went to the home to check on the family. Lassen Street at the time was a quiet little street in a bedroom-type community. Soul's Burgundy Rolls-Royce occupied the driveway, in stark contrast to the beat-up white Dodge van with his company name, Apollo Fire Extinguishers, that was parked in the street out front. The doors were locked, and no one answered when the doorbell was rung. The neighbors proceeded to walk around to the backyard, only to find the family's cocker spaniel named Mishmish barely responding to the neighbors as they entered the backyard. Something surely wasn't right. The neighbors managed to contact Elaine's cousin, Doreen Laffer. Doreen said that she had stopped by the house earlier that day to drop off some borrowed chairs and took note that no one seemed to be at home. While she thought that to be strange, she also noted that she hadn't heard from her cousin, which was unlike her to go more than a day without being in contact with each other. Further investigation revealed that Elaine hadn't shown up to her volunteer counselor work, at a nearby clinic, along with also learning the children 14-year-old Michelle and 9-year-old Mitchell hadn't attended school the past day. Elaine's mother, Marge, was reached, and since spending the evening with them on the 12th, she hadn't heard from Elaine also. It was time to bring in the police. Within minutes, a pair of uniformed officers from the LAPD's Devonshire Division pulled up to the Salomon's ranch house, and Marty Laffer, Doreen's husband, got there soon after. He'd recently resigned as an investigator with the IRS's criminal division and was unconvinced when, after a cursory look, the officers said they'd found nothing unusual. He urged them to check inside the house. He was quoted as saying, when Elaine goes to the bathroom, all her friends and relatives know, he told the police. There's two kids involved and it doesn't make sense that they would lock up the house and be gone without telling anybody. After a patrol sergeant arrived with permission to enter, Marty showed them how to get inside through a bathroom window in the back. The doors were locked, but the burglar alarm hadn't been activated. Marty phoned Doreen from the master bedroom. To him, everything looked fine, surveying the room. Even the bed was made. That's when Doreen panicked. Elaine never made the beds, she told Marty something was wrong. On closer inspection, the detectives found that Michelle's bed had been broken and that her pillowcases, sheets, and bedspread were gone. They also discovered blood droplets on her bedroom wall and mattress. A small patch of carpet had been cut out as well. In 1982, DNA analysis was largely unavailable, but the evidence suggested foul play to the police, who had nonetheless deemed it a missing persons case. On October 17th, a Caltrans worker happened upon a wallet belonging to one of the Salomons alongside the Antelope Valley Freeway, some 15 miles away. Additionally, the family's passports, wallets, and photos were discovered scattered alongside the Antelope Valley Freeway outside the town of Acton as a result of finding these personal documents belonging to the family. The case was immediately turned over to major crimes at Parker Center and reclassified as an active homicide investigation. The investigation subsequently focused on Harvey Rader, whom Sol was planning to see on the night he went missing. Rader was a British citizen with an extensive criminal history who owned a car dealership in which Sol had invested $20,000. The Salomon's Mercedes was found at Rader's garage. When questioned by police, Rader confirmed that he and Sol attended a car auction on the evening of October 12th and arrived together in Sol's van. Afterward, Sol asked Rader to drop him off at an Israeli restaurant at 10.30 p.m. Rader then drove Sol's van back to his house and rang the doorbell. When Elaine answered, she gave Rader the keys to the Mercedes, and he drove it to his garage for some repair work. Rader denied any involvement in the family's disappearance and told police that he believed Sol was involved in transporting guns with the Israeli mafia, as Sol's lifestyle seemed to exceed his income from his fire extinguisher business. However, there were inconsistencies with Raider's story. The car auction he supposedly attended with Sol ended at 5 p.m., even though Elaine's parents confirmed that Sol did not leave until 6 p.m. It also turned out the restaurant where Raider claimed he dropped Sol off was closed on that particular night. 
On October 20th, a week after the Salomon family was reported missing, the tension surrounding their disappearance reached a crescendo with a press conference led by Daryl Gates, L.A.'s confrontational police chief. He painted a picture of the investigation as, quote, difficult and perplexing, hinting at its potentially significant implications. Gates didn't mince words when he described the scene in Michelle's bedroom, noting the presence of blood. When pressed on the quantity, Gates's response was chilling, more blood than I would want to lose. The mention of soul raised eyebrows, with Gates acknowledging that the LAPD detectives had prior awareness of him, but they were withholding specifics. Rumors swirled about Soul's possible connections to the Israeli Mafia, an elusive network implicated in a variety of criminal activities spanning insurance and credit card fraud, drug trafficking, and extortion. The U.S. Justice Department had initiated investigations as early as 1979, assembling a task force to probe the extent of Israeli organized crime. In a particularly gruesome incident in October of that year, Los Angeles homicide detectives linked the Israeli mafia to the murder and dismemberment of a married Israeli couple. Their remains grotesquely scattered across the San Fernando Valley. As the investigation delved deeper, the shadowy reputation of the Israeli mafia loomed large, with whispers of global ecstasy smuggling emerging centered around Los Angeles as its hub of operations. Speculations regarding Seoul's involvement in clandestine activities only added fuel to the fire. Talk circulated about him being an Israeli intelligence operative, a drug dealer, or even a gun runner, suggesting the family might be on the run for his murky transgression. Yet, amidst the conjecture, a neighbor's account lent a chilling reality to the rumors. Recounting an encounter where Seoul had allegedly displayed Uzis for sale, the gravity of the situation became palpable. The neighbor's father, visibly shaken by the encounter, initially hesitated to share details until legal intervention prompted his testimony. Marty Laffer Doreen's husband knew that Sol was no saint, but he thought allegations about ties to any Israeli mafia were, quote, bullshit. According to him, the extent of Sol's misdeeds didn't go beyond some apartment buildings he owned and leveraged in an insurance scam. After the family disappeared, Marty kept Sol's business afloat for a short period and filed his taxes. As he told investigative journalist Stacy Perman, he said, quote, it was probably the first honest return Sol ever filed. The web of speculation, hearsay, and veiled truths surrounding the Salomon family's disappearance only deepened the mystery, leaving the community and law enforcement grappling with a complex puzzle fraught with uncertainty and danger. Then, 13 months later in November 1983, Raider's cousin, Ashley Paul, a taxi driver back in his native England, Paul worked as Raider's right-hand man, came forward with a shocking story. Paul had worked for Raider's dealership, but returned to England after the Salomons went missing. He eventually contacted the authorities after being pressured by a private investigator hired by Elaine's family. A woman who identified herself as a relative of Elaine's told Paul, that a group of California-based Israelis planned to hurt him and his family in retaliation for the Salomon's murders. The private investigator recalled the moment Paul broke, saying, quote, the first words out of his mouth, so help me God, were, Joe, you're right. Harvey's a psycho. With the private investigator in tow, Paul told Scotland Yard detectives that Raider murdered the Davises and the Salomons. Scotland Yard relayed his accounts to the LAPD, which wanted a formal statement. But Paul refused to cooperate further unless he was granted immunity from prosecution for the murder. After telephone negotiations, the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office drafted the deal, and Paul agreed to come to Los Angeles under Scotland Yard escort, provide statements to the LAPD, and help locate the bodies. Landing in Los Angeles on November 13, 1983, Paul was placed under armed guard and put up at the new Otani Hotel downtown. Paul told investigators he witnessed Raider shoot Sol in the head in the office at his dealership after Sol demanded repayment of the $20,000 he had invested. Paul claimed that another car dealer named Gerald Baxter and two Italian men were present and that he was instructed to drive Raider and the Italians to the Salomon home, where they subsequently murdered Elaine, Michelle, and Mitchell. Paul then helped 
raider bury the family's bodies in the desert in Antelope Valley. Paul also implicated Raider in the disappearance of a British couple named Peter and Joan Davis, who went missing on March 17, 1982. Paul lived next door to the Davises in Granada Hills and was said to have worked for the couple in the past, repairing their cars. When detectives first questioned him in connection with their disappearance, he said that he'd driven Peter Davis home from a car auction the night he went missing. But the police initially viewed Paul as a non-starter, and he returned to London, driving cabs again. The Davises lived only two miles away from the Salomons and did business with Raider's dealership. According to Paul, Raider murdered the couple in order to steal valuable artwork from their home, and he helped Raider bury the bodies in the desert near Bakersfield. Paul also claimed that Raider told him he was responsible for the January 1982 disappearance of a Burbank businessman named Ronald Adib, who also invested money in Raider's dealership, but Paul had no idea where A to B's body was. On November 14, 1983, Paul was supposed to lead investigators to the Salomon's remains in Acton, near Antelope Valley, but all they found was a tattered green quilt. A detective reportedly said, quote, We went out to the desert area, and he was trying to show us different areas where he thought the bodies were buried, but nothing worked out, he recalled. He was lying, or he didn't really want us to find the bodies, because he thought if we'd never find them, nobody could be prosecuted. The following day, a search for the Davises' bodies off the highway on the way to Bakersfield also yielded nothing. Police administered four polygraph tests to Paul. He failed them all. Investigators suspected that Raider had dumped the Salomon's bodies into one of the numerous mine shafts dotting the area. If I remember, an investigator said, Harvey told somebody he knew about mine shafts being a great place to bury bodies. But Paul never took us to the mine shafts. He only took us to areas where he thought there would be shallow graves. The same investigator frustrated that this brutal homicide case that got away was quoted, I'm still, to this day, convinced that Harvey planted that evidence out there off of Highway 14 on purpose and took the bodies in the opposite direction, he said, referring to the discovery early on of Soul and Elaine's wallets and papers. I mean, it's just something I think happened. He's a smart guy, cunning. But I had no evidence to prove that. Harvey Rader and Gerald Baxter were subsequently arrested on suspicion of murdering the Salomons, but released due to insufficient evidence. In fact, Baxter was cleared as a suspect, and Paul finally admitted that Baxter was not involved, and that the two Italians who supposedly helped with the murders did not exist. By lying, Paul had violated his immunity agreement, so he was charged with murdering the Salomons and the Davises. However, since no other evidence could be found to implicate Paul, a judge dismissed the charges, and he promptly returned to England. In September 1988, after Harvey Raider served a term for passport fraud and was facing deportation, the authorities decided to charge him with the murders of the Salomons. Paul refused to return to the United States to testify against him, and without any bodies or physical evidence, the case against Raider was very circumstantial. Raider faced the death penalty when his trial began May 6, 1989. Mark Lessam, a deputy public defender represented Harvey. Lessam was quoted as saying that Raider wasn't the only suspect in the case, indicating to Soul's circle of associates, and that the evidence against Raider wouldn't have sat for six years without charges being filed unless the case was weak. Lessam reported that his own investigators sprayed luminol in Raider's Mr. Motor office and didn't find a trace of blood. The prosecutor presented evidence that a woman saw Raider's car near Acton at the time of the Salomon's disappearance, but Lessam introduced someone who said Raider was at an auction at the time and nowhere near the desert. While the DEA said the motive for murdering the Salomons was robbery, Lessam maintained that police found $5,000 in Soul's home office safe. So obviously robbery wasn't a motive, Lessam said. Further, he found a prostitute who'd allegedly been with Soul that night, suggesting that Raider might not have been the last person to see him on October 12th. And he insisted that Soul and Raider were not in business together. It aggravated Lesson that the police didn't explore Soul's business activities and instead remained focused on Raider. 
according to him, Sol claimed to make $15,000 a year, which seemed impossibly low for someone living in that house, in that neighborhood, with those cars. He was quoted as saying he was a drug dealer, and I don't think there was any question of that. After three weeks of deliberations, the jury foreman sent a note to the judge on August 28, 1989, declaring, It is apparent we cannot come to a total agreement. The judge asked them to continue after which three more days of deliberations passed, but the jury of six men and six women remained deadlocked, eleven to one, for conviction. The judge declared a mistrial. Marge burst into tears. Outside Los Angeles County Superior Court in downtown L.A., she told reporters, I don't think justice was done in this case. She added, I'll never stop. I'm going to see that justice will be done. Harvey Raider's second trial opened in the same courthouse on January 4, 1990, and ended one day later in a mistrial due to what the judge deemed a conflict of interest. It turned out that the public defender's office was also representing the prosecution's key witness, an auto detailer in a drunk driving case, who was to testify that he saw bloodstains in a car Raider had driven after the Salomon's disappearance. So the public defender was barred from representing Raider. Joel Isaacson and Carl Jones took over the defense for Raider's third trial. Isaacson was recommended to Raider by accused mass murderer Fat Fred Knight, with whom the British expat shared a cell block. Isaacson had successfully defended Knight, one of three gang members charged in the killing of five teenagers, dubbed the 54th Street Massacre. Raider's new lawyers introduced a bigger question mark during the two-month trial. Investigators working for the legal team tracked down the sole juror who held out during the first trial, and she told them she wasn't convinced the Salomons were even dead. This became the central plan of defense in their case, raising the possibility with jurors that the Salomons were still alive despite a 1985 court ruling that declared them legally dead by homicide based in large part on the sealed statements made by Ashley Paula, a pharmacist, a gas station attendant, and a Carpinteria Police Department dispatcher all testified that they'd seen members of the Salomon family after they had been reported missing. The previous public defender privately said that he didn't find the witnesses credible. However, during his closing argument, which stretched more than three hours, Isaacson, the defense attorney, produced a map from his daughter's encyclopedia and put flags all over it, asking, the jurors, quote, where are the Salomons? Harvey Raider never took the stand. The jury deliberated for just two days. Raider was so nervous that Isaacs and his attorney had to hold him up. When the judge declared not guilty, Raider collapsed, hitting his head on the table. Isaacson was quoted as saying the reality is, everybody was shocked, including Mr. Raider, who fainted when they said not guilty. That's how much chance he thought he had. He is a killer. Marge shouted in the courtroom, What kind of system of justice is this? Where is the justice in the world? They make criminals of victims and victims of criminals. Marty Laffer was there too and shared the courthouse elevator with members of the jury before the verdict was delivered. They couldn't look me in the eye, he was quoted as saying. I knew we lost the case. It was a terrible feeling. Afterward, he went to the Friars Club in Beverly Hills, changed into his jogging clothes, and ran all the way to the beach and back. By the time he was done, his feet were bloody. Doreen couldn't take it after the trial. Everywhere she looked reminded her of places she'd been with Elaine. A year after the trial, she and Marty moved out of the valley. Marge remained haunted for her remaining days. Without the bodies, she was never able to hold a proper funeral, according to Jewish tradition. One detective was quoted as saying that he believed the talk of Israeli mafia and guns and dope was just a smokescreen. It's pretty ironic that we have seven dead people, and with all seven dead people, Harvey Rader was the last one to have anything to do with any of them. Ashley Paul and Harvey Rader have seemingly since disappeared without a trace. I think the twists and turns in this story leave the door open for many theories. What are your thoughts? Share them with me in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, 
please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos each Monday and Friday. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other videos on your screen. Thank you.